All right, guys, welcome back. Hey, I gotta say, uh, I certainly wasn't expecting such a positive response from the previous video that I made, and uh, I'm just happy to say that, or I'm just happy to to know that it's it's helping people out and everybody's getting something out of it. Uh, I would have never have thought that it would have had the reception that it did. So, uh, yeah, and uh, of course, welcome to the Discord channel for those of you that were able to find me. And questions and conversations are always welcome. Good to have you guys around. Um, and thank you for the the, the kudos for uh, for putting in the time. So. Alright, so in the previous video we talked heavily on the carrier numbers with regards to case one and VFR recovery. And we talked about how to set up the carrier. Uh, so now we're going to go into aircraft specific numbers um, and how to set up the aircraft. And then again, as I promised, uh, we'll, we'll get to some examples here in the actual jet, I promise. But uh, for sure we got to get all this nit uh administrative stuff done and out of the way first so all right so yeah we'll uh we'll talk about uh, just briefly the pattern and how it's massaged specifically for the hornet and uh, then we'll go into how to set the hornet up so that uh, again all these numbers will make sense and they'll they'll play out as we're talking about them and then we'll hop in the jet and uh, again get you that eyeball cal i keep promising you guys so all right, so that's set. Let's go ahead and hop over to my high-speed example with my amazing carrier drawing. Hornet typically comes to the break. Um, uh, I'm going to say 350 to 400 knots. Uh, I'm sure there's stories out there of the Sierra Hotel break. Uh, I won't get into any of that stuff. It's kind of from an error uh, that's come and gone, but. Uh, um, yeah, you could certainly come into the break faster, but we'll call it uh, 350, for four, 350 to 400 for our application. And again, just as we talked about before, you're going to come down the starboard side of the boat. And when you hit the, uh, the bow of the boat, um, the Hornet, you can go ahead and go into a break. Uh, there's no stipulation on maximum angle of bank. Typically, you don't, well, no more than 90 degrees. Uh, and there's no stipulation on how much G's you can pull. Uh, seven and a half G's is basically what the aircraft will limit you to. All right. But the bottom line is, is that whatever airspeed you bring to the brake, you need to bleed that airspeed off in such a manner, again, like we talked about, so that you arrive on the down one. Apologize for going through my, uh, my division here. But you'll arrive on the downwind with a speed at which you can configure and trim up and all that good stuff. So <clears throat> other than um, no more than 90 degrees angle of bank uh, and 7.5 G's, you basically can fly this uh, pretty much however you want as long as you can maintain pattern out or break altitude and that you achieve your goal of uh, configured on altitude on the reciprocal of the BRC and that you can configure and that you're in a position to be able to um, obviously trim up for again like I said on speed but so, so that you can go ahead and step down to your pattern altitude okay now there's a little bit more going on here we talked about our division coming into the break one two three and four Four bub is going into the break. Well, they don't all break together. One, or the leader, dash one, will kiss off the rest of his flight, and he'll go into the break, um, I'd say at around a half a mile-ish, okay? About half a mile to a mile. Some guys are super sporty, and they'll do it right at the bow. Uh, I would say... If you guys are learning how to do the break or you're learning all this stuff I'd say don't go into the break as dash one until you're at least a half a mile to one nautical mile down uh, past 
the bow of the boat. That'll that'll give you enough. What it does is that'll give you enough downwind to get all your ducks in a row so you're trimmed up on speed and that you're ready for the 180. Okay. Well, what happens when dash one breaks off and you got dash two, dash three, and dash four? Well, what'll happen is, is for the Hornet now, dash two will break approximately 10 seconds after dash one and then dash two will go into the break and he'll roll out behind lead and then about 10 seconds later dash three will break and he'll roll in behind dash two and lead and so on and so forth the only stipulation is you can't have breaks past four nautical miles okay so this has got to happen expeditiously now a lot of people get wrapped around the axle with this whole 10 seconds well if I'm doing 350 knots 10 seconds that's gonna you know string me out well here's the gig there's no hard and fast distance that this has to happen at the intent is so that ultimately you have the proper distance on downwind so that when everybody's coming off the 180 and rolling into the groove that you have a recover you have a trap interval of approximately 45 seconds okay so <clears throat> 10 seconds is a guide okay and the 10 seconds is to facilitate that trapping interval so lead traps uh, you know he, he backs out hook comes up uh, he, he taxis out of the LA they start bringing them past I don't know the six-pack and they're bringing them up to the to the um, or not the six-pack but uh, bringing them up to the cat and as about 45 seconds transpires dash two is trapping and then he, they take him off the cat, or they take him off the LA, off the wire, and they bring him over to the cat, and then 45 seconds, DAS 3 will recover. Okay? So you can see how that, that beat there of every 45 seconds is ultimately dictated by the interval of this break. Okay? Now, when DCS is a computer game, and a lot of the variables that you would encounter in real life, um, you know, slightly variations in wind, slightly vari slight variations in uh, 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 BRC, or I'm sorry, um, uh, winds over the deck, slight variations of steaming speed and all that good stuff would play into uh, how, to, how to manage the break. But since this is a computer game, everything's pretty well coded and it's going to happen uh, as advertised. So I bet you 10 seconds is going to work pretty darn solid. Okay. All right, so that's the break. Now, as far as interval is concerned, interval applies to both the break and if you were to come off of a touch and go or a catapult shot and you wanna go into the pattern, okay? Your interval is basically the guy who you're following, all right? So if you already have a Hornet in downwind, say so you got a Hornet right here, chugging along, approaching the 180, and you're a hornet coming in for the break. Well, you don't want to break until he's about, oh, I don't know, 30 degrees off your 3-9 line. All right? And again, it's not quite a hard, fast rule. What it does is it simply facilitates enough room so that when you do come to the break, he will have had enough time to transition down the downwind 180 and again to facilitate this 45 second recover time all right now that's for the break okay let's talk about the pattern for a second once everybody breaks and they're all chugging along in the pattern so we got one dash ones here dash twos here dash three and dash four and everybody's going same way same day they're all trimmed up they're all configured they're all at 600 feet AGL. Remember how before we said that the boat window for the abeam distance was 1 mile to 1.5 miles? 
Well, for the Hornet, you're looking for a solid 1.2. Okay? And what that does, based on the airframe specific aerodynamic properties of the aircraft, you roll into an approximate, or, well, into a relatively solid 30 degree angle of bank turn off of 1.2 a beam, and all those numbers that we talked about will work out. 450 at the 90, um, and then about 300 rolling out on the ball. And you're still going to work the same VSI, 100 to 200, coming off the 180, around 500-ish, approaching the 90, and then holding that as you come around the horn there. Okay. So again, there's another number specific for the Hornet. 1.2, a beam distance for the Hornet. Okay. <clears throat> As far as groove length, so this is the groove, right? I didn't really talk about this that much in the previous section, but the groove is the, is the portion of the approach where you fly the ball. Um, the groove is broken up into a couple of different parts, the start, the middle, in close, and so on and so forth. Again, I'm not gonna go into ball flying because it's pretty hard to do with a pen and a piece of paper, uh, but just understand that the groove, or the final, is broken down even to smaller pieces. And it's all pretty much predicated off of how you're doing in relationship to the ball. Okay. These numbers coming into the window, remember how we said you come in, if you arrive here at around 290 feet, 300 feet, on speed, trimmed up, 30 degrees angle of bank turn, the last few degrees required to line up with the angle deck will give you a ball on the lens and as long as the boat is doing the proper winds as it steams forward or a mixture of its steaming and headwinds you get about 25 to 30 knots you'll achieve a 15 to 18 second groove length um, typically you want right in the middle there about 17 seconds all right, shoot, shoot for a number, okay? About 17 seconds, groove length, all right? Once your mains touch the deck, and this pretty much goes for any aircraft, but once your mains touch the deck, whether you expect a trap, bolter, well, you, nobody expects to bolter, but if you expect a trap or a touch and go, you treat every pass as if you think you're gonna miss the wire. And the reason being is that if the, <laughs> luck will have it so that the one time that you're darn certain you're going to grab a wire will be the one time that you pull power and you bolter and you won't have the schlitz to actually do a touch and go and you'll peter off the end of the angle and you'll go into the drink and you won't survive uh, maybe you will you'll eject you'll be fine all right but the bottom line is the second the mains hit the deck you go to mrt and you climb away and just as with the previous example, you make your lazy right hand turn, you parallel BRC, and you climb up to pattern altitude on speed, 600 feet, and then you make a crosswind turn. This is the last bit of aircraft specific information that really comes into play in the pattern. And, that, and, we, and that's the interval when you're in the pattern already. We already talked about how to get into the pattern working at interval from the break, about 30 degrees off your, your left wing, so past your left wing, all right? But now how do, you t how do you know when to turn crosswind when your interval is already on downwind? Well, that's pretty simple for the Hornet at least, and that's when your interval is no kidding a beam, your left wing. So when your interval is pretty much right off your left wing, you can go ahead and start your 30 degree angle bank turn on speed, and you'll tchotchke just in place with everybody else, and you'll get right back in line, right back in the conga line, to be able to fly the pattern again. All right? So just a few of those ship numbers massaged to accommodate the F-18. So we'll go over them again real quick. You come into the break, 350 to 400 knots. Lead brakes at around a half a mile to a mile, no further than four miles. Dash two, dash three, and dash four, they all subsequently break at 10 second intervals. 
you don't break lead won't break until interval is at least 30 degrees past his left wing okay everything's the same once you get on downwind configure you, oh configuration is full flaps uh, landing gear speed brakes in speed brakes in and then your hook up or down if you want to do a touch and go if you want to do a trap a beam distance is 1.2 okay all of your VSI altitude and angle of bank management is pretty much the same about 30 degrees angle of bank all right groove length about 17 seconds um, touch and go or bolter is the same parallel BRC fly away on speed climb up to pattern altitude 600 feet Okay, climb up to 600 feet. And then your crosswind turn is made when you have your interval, a beam your left wing, a beam your wing. So if you had somebody way the heck up here, you would have to fly upwind until your interval was across your left wing. And then you could go ahead and turn crosswind. Okay. All right. There's all the pattern information specific to the Hornet. Now we're going to go into DCS. We're going to talk about how to set DCS up so that uh, all these angle of banks and the turn circle will yield the, the size that you would expect to be able to uh, hit, the, hit the groove and, again, fly all the numbers as advertised. All right, let's go ahead and hop in the jet real quick. All right, finally in the Hornet, finally in the seat. Okay, before we go flying, I'm going to talk about how to set up the aircraft. Uh, so we talked about all the procedures at the boat, the boat numbers. We talked about how to set up the boat. Then we talked about how those boat procedures can be massaged specifically for the Hornet. Now we're going to talk about how to set up the Hornet so that uh, when we actually take this bird flying, we go into the brake, we come off the 180, and we hit the groove. We trap, perfect uh, OK pass, and uh, you know the clouds part, the birds sing, the heavens rejoice, and all that good stuff. So, okay, so the first thing we'll talk about here is uh, Hornet weight. So the aircraft weight. Um, now it's real easy in the game to throw the plane out there on a runway or airborne or wherever it may be, and we all kind of get starry-eyed and become kids in candy stores. And just start thinking to ourselves, yeah, I want to, I want those missiles. You know, I want to kit this thing out with as much stuff as I can carry. I'll take all the AIM nines you can give me, throw some AMRAMs on there. Uh, you know, Sparrow, drop tank, hell yeah, who doesn't like more gas? All that good stuff. Well, here's the issue. Uh, yeah, so the plane gets considerably heavy pretty quick, right? Forty-something thousand pounds, forty-four thousand pounds. I don't know. Really starts adding up there. Well, the deal is, is that the Hornet's got a maximum trap weight of 30, 33, 33,000 pounds with a restricted weight of 34,000 pounds. And then you got center line, maximum 500 pounds, all that good stuff. But you know what? We're just going to keep it simple. We're going to keep it 33,000 pounds max trap weight. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the real world, uh, well, <laughs> so some real world considerations with that is obviously if you trapped greater than 33,000 pounds, you're probably going to break something. Uh, um, you're going to bend some metal and piss off the CAG and piss off the owner of the boat. And probably break your plane and piss off your skipper and all that good stuff. So, so that's uh, that's kind of the real world uh, scenario. Um, more to the game, also real world, but more specifically to the game. What is an excessive weight going to do for you in the pattern? Well, the heavier you are, the more lift the wings have got to create. And uh, that means it's also uh, the plane ultimately has to go faster for your on speed speed, right? So uh, your on speed speed is going to increase to produce the extra vertical lift required to keep your heavy loaded out butt airborne, right? Well, when you approach the 180 with that higher on speed, 
and you uh, start to transition, you come off with your 30 degrees angle bank turn, that extra speed is going to make your turn circle larger. And that turn circle being larger is going to create an overshooting condition. Overshooting conditions are kind of a real pain in the butt. Um, especially when you're trying to keep your energy state nice and stable for intercepting the ball and flying a good three and a quarter glide slope down to a trap. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't scenarios where if you overshoot you just do some of that pilot stuff and you make it happen but what we're trying to do here is just kind of keep things nice and predictable so that they're easily repeatable so that we can get a lot of practice and wrap our heads around it and so ultimately we don't get ridiculously frustrated and punch a hole in our monitors right something like that okay so when you're going to the boat what you're going to want to do is when you're in the marshalling stack or, or somewhere prior to hitting the initial because when you hit the initial you're probably sucking low and you're all up on formation on your lead and you're going 350 knots at 800 feet that's probably not the time to do what i'm about to show you what you should do and that is looking down in the cockpit <laughs> And you're going to look at one of your displays, but more importantly, what you're going to do is you're going to bring up your checklist page. And that's up here in the upper right, checklist, and it's going to give you your aircraft weight. So you can see, I don't even have anything on the wings. I mean, I've got hard points. I don't even have anything in this aircraft. Just a full bag of gas is, well, and a full nose of, gun, of, of lead also, so... Um, is giving me 36,000 pounds. So I'm already 33, you know, 3,000, 4,000 pounds overweight. Okay. So my turn circle is going to be big, and I can already anticipate that coming off the 180 with the proper beam distance of 1.2 is going to be a pain in the ass. So there's a few ways you can fix that, right? You either get rid of the ordnance, you dump it in the ocean, or go have a dogfight with your buddy, or some, roll in on the tanker that's orbiting overhead or something like that or you come down here and you got your fuel dump switch right about there and you click that on and you burn the fuel down or you you bleed the fuel out until you're down to your uh, max trap weight uh, and again um, you know that's that's to make sure that all of our numbers play out as we anticipate them to uh, with all of our Hornet specific uh, parameters, 1.2, on speed, all that good stuff. And that uh, we have a very repeatable scenario so that we can practice ultimately our ball flying. We, could, we can come up with some good habit patterns to uh, uh, some good, you know, good ball flying to trap the plane. All right, so that's how you want to set up the aircraft uh, as far as uh, weight's concerned. Now more to a technique uh, regime. I'm going to talk about how to set up the navigational aids and how I like to use them in the aircraft. And I tend to use them this way to this day. Uh, these having patterns haven't changed for me in over, goodness, 12 years, 13 years, something like that. So <clears throat> the first thing that's nice to, that's good to have is having the tack and tuned up for the boat. And the boat will typically default if you just throw it in the ocean. It'll typically default to one X-ray. Okay, so the way you turn that guy on in the jet, you come over here to tech and you for control, and you've got all your segmented LEDs on the right column. If you can't see them, you can turn them up with the brightness knob. And if this upper segmented LED or uh, segmented yeah LED is empty, that means your tech ends off. So you come down here, tech, turn your tech and on, and it'll tell you the frequency that you're tuned in on. And lo and behold, the default is one. And down here we got x-ray colonize so we're tuned to one x-ray and you want to make sure that you're in transmit receive okay so now the jets looking for and trying to receive the tack end information coming off the boat well now we got to set up our <coughs> navigational display our primary navigational display is the one between the legs down in the the center of the aircraft here it's one with the moving map now the thing with the moving map um even in real life this was kind of in the beginning inception of the GPS world and the moving map world when this first came out. And in short, this moving map is just like visual vomit. Like the resolution's crap. You can't really see things all that well. I mean, with the exception that, you know, right now that 
that's ocean and that's land. <laughs> but other than that, it's it's kind of hard to use the map. Typically, all we did was we'd look down at the map on the on the uh, display there, and we'd look at the map in our hand, and we'd say to ourselves, "Yeah, that's the same place." And then we'd ultimately go off the map in our hand. Um, for me, outside of doing that, I would typically come over to this button right here, third down on the left side. And I'd go to the black and white display for the HSI. And you can see right off the bat that we got the tack and needle, which is, is this triangle with the T in it. And it's pointing at the boat out there somewhere. And it's showing us that we're at a DME of 6.6. .6. Okay. Um, okay, so how do, how do I like to use this at the boat? Well, uh, first of all, it gives you your DME distance and we want a good solid 1.2 at the beam of which when the needle hits the left edge obviously we're a beam so the the boat's going to be off there on our left side the needle's going to be off on the left side of the case of the hsi and it's going to show us the dme of hopefully a 1.2 well the problem i have here is if you're going to use that as a good quality assurance that your pattern geometry is nice and square your scan is going to be outside at the boat inside at your HUD and then down into the bowels of the airplane to get your information. So your scan's kind of kind of big, kind of wonky, right? So how do we shorten that up? Well, I'm sure some of you guys already know that, hey, I can come over here, click the TACAN box. What's that going to do? It's going to throw my TACAN distance, my DME, distance measuring equipment, up here above the nose wheel steering uh, information line. So now my scan is a little bit simpler. It's just left and right. Okay. Well, personally, I like to still get azimuth information. There's a bunch of different techniques for why I get azimuth, why I still want to use uh, um, bearing information. And I'll kind of go into that more when I actually fly the plane for you. Um, but <clears throat> in short, the only place where you can get bearing information is back down here on the HSI. Well, uh, right now, the plane defaults so that it repeats the HUD on the left display there. Uh, we typically didn't fly around with the HUD in, in the display and in the HUD. It was kind of redundant. The only time we threw the HUD down in any of the displays is when we lost the HUD. And of course, since we're all HUD cripples, uh, the first thing we want to do is get that HUD back. So we throw it down here. But for the most part, if the HUD's working, we can use the real estate on the other displays for something a little more useful. So what I like to do is, at the boat, I would put the HSI on the left display so that when I'm doing my scan outside at the boat, inside at the hut, I can see just out of the bottom peripheral of my eyesight there without having to move my head too far down, I can get my bearing information instead of having to look all the way down in the bowels of the aircraft so all right so that's pretty much uh there you have it that's that's how i like to set up the jet as far as navigational aids are concerned um and then of course uh just making sure that i'm harping on focus focusing on uh your weight being at least 33 or less so that your turn circle can come out as expected when you come off the 180 so all right, that's pretty much for the jet setup. Pretty simple. Uh, next time, the next video I make, I promise we're going to get in the jet and actually be airborne. Uh, I'm going to go into uh, a walk the dog on uh, going into the mar I'll, I'm going to try and take a flight of aircraft. We'll go into the Marshall stack. We'll come down, approach the initial, go into the brake. Hopefully uh, have proper spacing. Come off the 180, show you what on speed looks like and all that good stuff. And I'll try and come up with some techniques on how to maintain on speed, how to how to manage the brake and slow down. I know that's a big question because that's uh, there's no real hard and fast rules for that that particular part of the evolution. Uh, Going to go into what it means to be on speed, how on speed is manipulated by the pilot, um, and why the displays do what they do when you uh, manipulate the various controls. Uh, ultimately, so that you can fly a good plane and uh, get an okay pass and trap. So. All right, so the next video will be in the jet. Again, I appreciate it for you guys tuning in. If you got any questions, come find me on Discord. And uh, thanks again, y'all. We'll talk to you soon.